Hello, I'm Barry Daniel, and this is the podcast of the Middle Way Society. Our aim is to encourage a universal approach to living a more integrated, ethical life, avoiding dogma or any appeal to authority. Our guest today is Mark Williams, who is a professor of paleobiology at the University of Leicester. He's the co-author, along with Jan Zalazevich, of The Goldilocks Planet, The Four Billion Year Story of Earth's Climate, and has published several peer-reviewed papers on paleobiology, paleoenvironment, and paleoclimates in conjunction with other researchers, including his latest, The Anthropocene Biosphere, which explores the impact of humans from a geological perspective on the biosphere and also looks at how potentially humans are uniquely driving a sixth mass extinction and this will be uh, the topic of our discussion today. Hello Mark, welcome to the uh, Middle Way Society podcast. Hello Barry, thank you very much for inviting me. Okay, well could you begin Mark by telling us a little bit about yourself and what prompted you along with your colleagues to undertake this research? Okay, well, as you said in the introduction, Barry, I'm a paleobiologist at the University of Leicester. And for the past 30 years or so, I've been studying the geological record of life on Earth. As a paleobiologist, I'm I'm interested in that story over its enormity of time. And I spend my time basically trying to understand how the Earth and the biosphere have evolved over their four billion years of time on planet Earth using the fossil record. Okay, and then could you give us a bit of a background about these early extinction events and, and what they had in common or not. Okay, so so to do that, I have to kind of give you the context of, of biosphere evolution over time. Yes. So I'm going to give you four billion years of history in a, in a few minutes here. So <laughs> if, if we go back in time, we can see chemical evidence for the birth of the biosphere probably around about four billion years ago. So it's an enormously resilient component of the Earth system. It's been there for all of that time. Um, And we can also, from a little bit later in the geological record, see evidence of fossil evidence of life from about three and a half billion years ago. And over its evolution, as it unfolds, it becomes more complex through time. Um, For the first um, three billion years or so of the story of life, we have a very sparse fossil record. And and that record is mainly of microbial organisms, Um, although sometimes those microbial organisms build quite large structures that we can see. But for the past half billion years, the past 500 million years, the fossil record is replete with evidence of life on planet Earth. There's a fundamental change about 500 million years ago. It was spotted by Charles Darwin in the middle of the 19th century. And what we see about 500 million years ago is all of the kind of modern animal phyla that we find on Earth at present evolving. So over that past 500 million years, we've had the diverse, complex ecosystems that we're all familiar with at present, both in the oceans, And then from about 450 million years ago, that actually translocated onto the land. And we started to build the complex ecosystems we have on land also. So that's the kind of broad context for the biosphere. And then you asked me about extinction events and about major evolutionary events. Well, we we can see evidence for these all the way through the geological record. So we can see major evolutionary events in the in the deep Precambrian as long ago as two and a half billion years ago, for example, we can see the invention of modes of making energy that use that liberate oxygen. So we get oxygenic photosynthesis and that's a big event in very deep time. But for the first kind of three billion years of Earth history, the fossil record is very difficult for us to actually pin down extinction events, although they probably were actually occurring. For the last 500 million years, though, we can see them with a a high degree of precision and we can recognize five distinct ones in that past 500 million years of time. Um, So there's a big one that happens about 440 million years ago, another one about 360 million years ago, another one about 250 million years ago, another one 200 million years ago. And then the one that I think most people are familiar with is the one that happens about 66 million years ago. And that one is the the time, the Cretaceous tertiary boundary. It's the time that the Earth was probably impacted by a very large meteorite um, that caused the extinction of the dinosaurs. When we go back and we look at these different events, so there are these five in the, in, the, in the last 500 million years, 
they are all different in terms of the causal mechanisms, the mechanisms that actually produce those extinctions. So we have the big one that knocks out the dinosaur 66 million years ago. But if we went back 440 million years ago to the, the first big one, if you like, of the last half billion years, then it's probably associated with very, very fundamental changes in, in climate at that time. Um, or if we come forward to the one 250 million years ago, the Permo Trias, which is the most severe one of the last half billion years, probably wiped out something like 95% of species diversity in the oceans. And that's probably associated with a whole mixture of different events that include monumental volcanism on planet Earth at that, at that time. Um, so they've got different mechanisms. So we see these big extinction events unfolding. And from a geological perspective, they're, they're short-lived. So I have to qualify that. Short-lived for a geologist is a million years. Um, and, then, and then what we see is that the Earth system starts to reconstruct itself. The biosphere reconstructs itself. And that, that process can take, you know, five, six, seven million years. But over time, all of the species diversity that's lost at those extinction events starts to recover. Now, that's really good because what that tells us is that the biosphere, this complex biosphere that we've had for the last half billion years, is very, very resilient and can recover from major fundamental kind of catastrophes in the, in the Earth system. So that's a cause for hope then, potentially? That's a cause for hope. And I, I think many people I, I chat to about the impact of humans on the biosphere, well, a, a good point to make is that human impact is likely going to be very considerable, but the impact is likely to be more severe for humans than it is for the biosphere, because the biosphere will recover in over you know over the course of several million years okay. where the human where the humans as a species survive that's another matter that's i think another matter, yeah. okay well we're not in the midst of a, a, a new extinction event yet but th there's a likelihood that there might be one in the near future but this one is different isn't it in, in that we seem to be the cause yeah th this one's unique so as, as we look back at all of those different major events and actually, you know, be, be the extinctions or major changes in the way the biosphere has structured itself. It doesn't appear to us from that four billion years of history that any of these big events has ever been caused before by a single species. So we talked about the extinction events over the past 500 million years. We noted that they were driven by things like climate change and meteorite impact. What appears to be completely unique about the present potential trajectory towards an extinction event, and we're not yet in that extinction event, but the potential trajectory towards that is that it would be caused largely by the actions of a single species, of, of, of our species, and that appears to be unique from a geological perspective. Okay, and then in the paper, it's, you break it down to four particular characteristics that make this potential extinction crisis unique, and the first one being the spread of non-native species around the world. Yeah, I mean, so there's a unique signature there from the impact of humans. So if we look back in geological time, over time, the, the, the continental positions have changed. So they, they move about through the process of plate tectonics. So a good example of that is India bumping into Eurasia and making the Himalayas. And when continents collide, they often exchange fauna and flora. And we can see that in the fossil record. So a very good example is the Great American Interchange that occurred about three million years ago when North America was joined to South America through the Central American Isthmus. And we can see in the fossil record very clearly organisms from South America going north and organisms from North America going south. Yeah. So that we can see at a kind of specific continental scale. What is different about present is that humans have translocated organisms across the whole planet, even to areas that are geographically remote that couldn't possibly be bridged by pre-human or non-human processes. Um, a good example would be the flora of New Zealand. Um, there are now nearly as many introduced non-native plant species in New Zealand as there are indigenous species. And this is a global phenomena. And it, it's not just a land-based phenomena. It's also a marine phenomena. So we've been moving marine species around the planet. Um, a good example is the lionfish, which originated in the seas of Southeast Asia, which is now infesting reef systems on the east coast of, of North America and, and actually doing considerable damage in, in those ecosystems. Um, so so that's, that's a very human signal. I need to qualify that by saying that sometimes when humans translocate species, they can damage the environment in which they occupy. And those are often referred to as invasive species. Sometimes, of course, they can be beneficial. So this is not necessarily a deleterious feature of human action, although it can have deleterious effects. So there are losers and winners in this. 
There are losers and winners in this game. And of course, the other thing maybe to emphasize here is that the species which has been invasive on a global scale, the, the, the neobiotic species, to use the kind of t term that we used in the paper, par excellence, is that is uh, humans, of course, because yeah. we've invaded every continent, including the Antarctic, from our origin point in Africa. OK, and then let's move on to the second one. That is a single species, namely us, taking over a significant percentage of the world's primary production. Yeah, so that, that's something else. We, look, we looked back at the geological record and, and we, we tried to find another instance where we could see one species dominating such a large proportion of the net primary production. So, this, so, so using the net primary production, that's all of the, the energy which is, if you like, converted to biomass, which is used by plants both on the land and, and in the oceans. And on the land, it represents a considerable amount of the biomass. And at present, humans are appropriating, depending on different estimates, somewhere between about 30 and 40 percent of all the net primary production, on, wow. on, on, so, so, which is a staggering amount. A quarter to a third of all that net primary production is now, is now consumed by us. Um, or the animals that we use, or converted to biofuels, or, or so it's not just food stuff. It's the way in which we appropriate the whole lot for different um, reasons. And presumably, a lot of a lot of species that had access to that at one stage are now going hungry or, or needing to find new habitats to try and to survive them. That's it. So, I mean, this is part of the kind of marginalization of pre-human ecosystems and the reduced space which is available to the, the non-human influenced component of the biosphere. So the other thing which I always find is a really kind of striking figure is that, of course, it's not just to the, the primary production that humans have actually had a major influence. We've also had a, a major influence on secondary production. So those the, the, the organisms, the herbivores, for example, that eat the plants. And on the patterns of consumption, so the way in which we then consume both the plants and, and that secondary production, the herbivores. And a, a good figure, a very striking figure, it's a figure of Václav Smil. It's not, not my data, but it's in a series of papers that he's written, is that humans and the animals, our commensal animals, so our cows, our sheep, our pigs, etc., represent 97% of the terrestrial vertebrate biomass. And everything else... So that's, you know, elephants, zebras, rats, all that lot, 3%. Wow. That's, that, that's staggering, I think. That is a staggering figure. And, and what percentage of the marine environment and the terrestrial landscape have already been fundamentally modified by human activity, would you reckon? So, so there, are, there again, there, are, there is a wide range of, of estimates, but the figures, I think, which are very reliable out there would suggest that something like 40% of the land, terrestrial land surface has been converted for, for human agriculture. Um, and, and quoting Earl Ellis, who's, who was one of the co-authors on the paper, um, and Earl is particularly interested in the way that human influenced landscapes have evolved over time. Earl would suggest that now, at this point in time, something like 75% of the terrestrial land surface, then the ice-free land surface, I should emphasize, is, is either dominated by humans or strongly impacted by humans. So that's 75%. Um, so 25% is still wilderness. And of course, even in the wilderness, the, the human influence is there. Is there yeah, just through the atmosphere, yeah? Even if you go at the top of Everest, it's affected by humans to an extent. Yeah, it is, absolutely. And the, the other figure I can give you, so that's, that's taking the terrestrial component of the biosphere, but there's, a, there's obviously the marine component is also a major component, and humans now take something like 158 million tonnes of fish-type products out of the oceans each year, of which about 40% is from aquaculture, which is basically human-farmed products from the ocean. So again, that's a fundamental change in the way in which the ocean biosphere actually works. Again, it shows, shows our impact on the oceans. Yeah, well, that, that sort of leads on to the next characteristic, that human actions are increasingly direct in evolution. Yeah, so we can look at that from a whole host of different ways. And actually, we've, we've touched on some of those already. Yeah. So in terms of the way in which we've changed the, the food webs on land and in the oceans. So in the past, it's never been the case that a single species has dominated the food webs in the oceans and on the landmass. Um, so there are various ways of looking at the kind of ecological imprint of, of humans. And so an ecologist might look at it from the perspective of what we eat. Um, and of course, as omnivores, we eat a whole range of different things. We eat meat, but we also eat lots of plant products too. And that kind of places us as a kind of middle, middle level in most kind of food webs. 
we're actually equivalent to, to pigs on the land in terms of, of our food web position, our, our trophic position. And we are equivalent to anchovies if we were if we were in the in the sea. But that that doesn't look at it from the perspective of the way in which humans have actually displaced the top predators. So we've displaced all of the top predators on the land. We are now basically the apex predators even though we, we're not eating a diet which is necessarily an apex predator type of diet. So, so that, that's a major influence in, in the terms of the overall ecosystem evolution that humans have been inducing to, to the, both the marine and, and terrestrial biosphere. But at a more fundamental level, our science now enables us to manipulate the genetics of, of organisms. And of course, this is a, a science which has really been evolving since Gregor Mendel in the, in the 19th century. But I think one, one example that we use in the paper, which, which we think is, is really fundamental, because it's fundamental from the perspective of how plants can concentrate biomass. So we use the example of, of a recent paper published by Lynn et al. in Nature, um, in, in the scientific journal Nature last year, um, where they're discussing about the way in which you can translocate the photosynthetic mechanism from more primitive primary producers. So these are the kind of cyanobacteria, which are Earth's first kind of, kind of primary producers. You can take the photosynthetic mechanism from them and translocate it into the into higher plants and by so doing potentially increase the way in which those plants can fix energy and biomass so that's a very fundamental change and that's a very good example i think of the way in which humans can now really fundamentally change change the biosphere in the 21st century it's a process which has been on developing over hundreds of thousands of years in terms of our directed evolution of animals and plants, but now it's really absolutely fundamental. One of the things that I found interesting about the um, paper is that we are not just affecting a potentially epoch-changing event in geological time, but arguably an era, era one, as big as uh, when microbes first came onto the planet or the, when the Cambrian explosion that you were talking about. So, so, yeah, I'm part of a group called the Anthropocene Working Group. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to look to see if the impact of humans on planet Earth is as fundamental as some of the major changes in deep time. And what we do as part of that group is we, we assess a whole range of different parameters. So not, not just the biosphere, but we look at the we look at the climate system, for, for example, and we look at changes in, in river sedimentation patterns. Um, we're being very careful as a group of scientists in the way in which we do that. There's about, about 30 of us across the world trying to evaluate this boundary. And at the moment, we're, we're considering it from the perspective of an, of an epoch level change. So that's a relatively small division in terms of geological time. But actually what we think from the perspective of the biosphere is that the changes may be much more fundamental. Yeah. Now, there's two, two ways to look at this. So it might be that whatever we think about the impact of humans, if you were visiting planet Earth from a million, a million years hence and you were to look back for the geological record, you would see a distinctive signal of humans. It, it would be there in a whole range of different things, you know, plastics, um, ceramics, um, concrete, whatever. You'd see a, a clear geological signature and you'd see it in the biosphere also. You'd see a kind of change in the paleontology. You'd see all these species coming in and being moved around the, being moved around the planet. Now that can go probably various different ways. What might happen, of course, is that we cannot actually sustain the changes that we've been making. And in that sense, our impact would be relatively short lived because our civilization, our society's structures might all actually collapse in because we because of the change we've produced. And then I suspect what you would see would be an epoch level change. You would it would be about an epoch level boundary because the biosphere would spring back fairly rapidly from the impacts of humans. The alternative, of course, is that we've actually started down a trajectory which is fundamentally altering the whole pattern of the way in which the biosphere works. And that, that will probably bring us to the, I guess, what might be your final point about the technosphere. I can, I can see the lead into this. Um, and if that trajectory maintains itself, so if this connection between the technosphere, which is humans, their technological artifacts and all of the kind of social and technological networks that that marry that together if that can continue and continue to evolve and can also become sustainable because at the moment it's using up a lot of the earth's natural resources then we may have fundamentally altered the earth system over a very very long time frame 
from a from a geological perspective. And that's really what we were arguing in the paper is that there are there are various different alternative scenarios for this. Um, but that is that's certainly probably the two key ones are that this is not sustainable and there is actually a collapse or it becomes sustainable. And if it becomes sustainable, then we are dealing with something which is absolutely fundamentally different from anything in Earth history prior to this. Yeah. So then it would become a much more significant geological boundary and change in, in the biosphere. OK, well, can we just try and un unpack this term uh, technosphere a, a little bit more? It was, it was a, a term that one of your colleagues, that one of the um, co-authors of the paper coined last year, I think, was it, is it P.K. Half? It's Peter Half, yes, it Peter is. Peter Half, yeah. OK, so this is very much the idea of Peter and Peter's, Peter is a co-author on the paper and the technosphere is, is very much has come out of Peter. Um, so, so I gave you a kind of def a, a quick definition there in the previous um, conversation. A good way of looking at it is the is humans, the structures that they produce. So their technological artifacts, if you like, and the te technological networks and social networks and structures that bind all of that together. And what Peter has argued very um, coherently, I think, and what we also discuss in this paper is that the two systems, if you like, the two components of that system, which are the kind of human component and the technological component, if you kind of pull them down as the most rudimentary components, actually are completely reliant on each other and that neither can now exist without the other. Um, so we often think as humans that we have very strong power as individuals to actually change things. Um, but what Peter's arguing is, in fact, the technosphere now is actually to some degree has its own degree of control and that humans have a very limited capacity to change that. OK, there are major technological innovations that come along and impact on that. You could say the uh, the Internet or the World Wide Web is a major, major human change that's had an impact on that. But nevertheless, as individuals, we are completely reliant on that system. So if our technolo the technological component of the technosphere was to decay, disintegrate tomorrow, we would not be able to sustain the huge number of human beings who are on this planet. So at present, there are seven billion of us, and we're accelerating towards nine and a half billion by the middle of the century. But we are only sustained by all that network of technology, which enables us enables us to do that. And without it, we would probably revert to a much a much smaller human population, probably of a few tens of millions. So the technosphere has been unfolding over a long period of time. Really, it's been unfolding from the time when humans or the, the earliest humans or even you could argue apes, you know, before that, because we share these these characteristics with apes, actually picked up the first artifacts, implements and started to use them. And from then on, the artifact, if you like, had a vested interest in encouraging the human to develop it. And the human had a vested interest in in using the artifact because it benefited the human in actually hunting or, or I don't know, skinning an animal or, or, or making a fire or whatever. And ever since then, there's been a synergy where we are effectively now completely linked together. The, the one cannot exist without the other. Um, and that's really what Peter what Peter is suggesting in the technosphere. And that is another new component because inherent in that is that the biosphere is inextricably linked to the technosphere or well, certainly the, the human component of it not just the human component all the commensal animals and plants that are associated with it and of course another potential trajectory is that the technosphere gets to a stage where it becomes stable and decides it doesn't need the biosphere as well that's also one potential trajectory that we've that we've kind of mooted so there are all these different potential routes of the future i think that's not the one we favour. We obviously favour one where the biosphere and the technosphere are actually cohabiting for the benefit of everybody. And that's that's really, I think, what we hope is the, is the route forward. So you, you can envisage a techno-biosphere where the technosphere is, in effect, integrated with the biosphere as opposed to the present, where you suggest in the paper that it appears to be parasitising the biosphere. The, I think, again, there are, diff, there are different ways of thinking about this, but... One of the big problems we have at present, and, and you can say that the technosphere is driving this, so, so in the, the energy consumption that the technosphere uses, doesn't allow the whole Earth system to actually recycle components. So you could think about the carbon accumulation in the atmosphere, which is a direct result of humans burning, or the, the increased carbon accumulation in the atmosphere. There's a direct 
um, impact of humans burning burning fossil fuels. So that's a change in the carbon cycle. It means that it, the, the, the carbon cycle has been changed by the actions of humans with the with the technosphere. Now that can't go on without it having a fundamental impact on the climate. Um, as the Met Office has been telling us today, it looks like we're now probably one you know one, one degree warmer already um, relative to pre-industrial levels, and you can already see kind of analogs of that and the other things that we don't recycle so plastics are a good example they are hydrocarbon based we make plastic from from the hydrocarbons that we dig dig out of the ground but we don't recycle them we accumulate them in landfills they accumulate at the side of the road in fields wherever it's a classic example of, of how humans as part of the technosphere do not recycle the components that they need to sustain that integrated system over long time frames now, now, again, we can see you know, that the biosphere has been here for four billion years. There's always been a relatively good synchronicity between the way in which organisms produce and the way in which organisms consume and then are themselves consumed so that this kind of cycle of production and consumption goes on. One of the things we're thinking about now is that actually humans are quite are fundamentally changing that as well. And the technosphere is a major component of that in that we do not recycle the things that we need to sustain the whole system over over long time frames and that's something we've got to solve in a very very short space of time yeah because arguably it's the speed of this technosphere evolution which is is fundamentally different from biological evolution yes it is and and actually here i call on my friend jan zelazevich because he's the, the the gentleman who came up with the term technofossil which are which are which is kind of a new a new idea about um well in the fossil record we see lots of different kinds of fossils we see skeletal fossils um, we sometimes see the soft tissues preserved or we sometimes just see the traces of animals or plants we came up with a new term which which was technofossil which was the, the fossil record of human artifacts um, and if you think about it, the, the, the incredible diversity now that we have in those human artifacts, it, it's really profound. And we can compare it again with the geological record. So if we go back half a billion years, we have this big change from this microbial biosphere that ex existed for the three billion odd years before to this very complicated animal plant based biosphere that we've had for the last half million years. And you see a really significant change in the range of kind of body plants as you go into the Cambrian. So the diversity and the, the morphological disparity increases dramatically. And it's almost as though we're going through a similar kind of event at present. Only this time it's not biological because biological evolution simply cannot go at the pace of, of what's happening at present. It's happening at the kind of technological artifact level. Um, a good example is the number of, I think, is it mobile phones in circulation at present? There are three and a half billion mobile phones and something like seven billion connections. So it's actually caught up with the number of human beings on, on planet Earth. Now, the team who wrote the paper weren't in total agreement about this fourth characteristic, the technosphere, in particular Earl Ellis. Now, what were his reservations and what would be uh, Peter Hafs or your responses to his reservations? OK, so I think... We wrote that paper very much as a team effort, and I think all of us agree with the with the overall themes in the paper. And we, well, we all put our names to it, so we very much did feel that. I think there's, it's just a balance between Earl and Peter, and actually Earl and Peter would be able to explain this to you much better than I can. Um, I think that Earl wanted to emphasise the capacity of humans and human organisation to actually mitigate the effects of humans long term. Um, and he, he, he can give some very good examples about that. I mean, one good example is we've, we've already talked about biodiversity change and about bio extinction. Um, and, and of course, so biodiversity globally, you could argue, is, is actually falling because we are reducing ecosystems for organisms to survive in. But often at a local level, biodiversity is actually increasing because of these species that have been translocated. So it's not all is not loss. And that's using a phrase directly from Earl. Um, and I'm also optimistic. I think, you know, we have to op be optimistic that humans can become stewards of nature. Um, we've been perhaps rampaging through the sweet shop mm -hmm. and we have to change the way in which we see our place in the biosphere, I think. And the various ways that I think we can do that. Um, so that's that's really the, the kind of nub, nub of, the, of the discussion and debate that we had in the in the paper. Um, but we're all, I think we're all pretty much behind the paper. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I should disagree anyway. It's a good thing. We should it is. All, I think. Exactly, so. yeah. Um, well, it's, 
it's good to hear it's not too late uh, so should we move on to what we can do now you've touched on this a little bit already uh, mark but to what extent do you think new frameworks of global thinking such such as the need for environmental protection sustainability and perhaps the anthropocene idea itself are already having an effect in us dealing with this crisis I think they are. I think we can be optimistic. We, we can be very destructive as a species, but we can also be very constructive. And we do have, we can actually use the technosphere in that sense from a beneficial perspective because it actually enables us to communicate ideas. I, I see some really good signs of the way in which humans can respond to this. I, I was at a conference in, in Yale about a month back with, a, with, a, with architects as the kind of geologist representing the geological view. And I met two people there, um, Seth and Ariana Harrison, who are designing um, structures in New York to actually bring the biosphere back into the city. And I actually thought their work was marvellous. So they've got something called the species wall. So instead of just building a brick wall or a, or a plain wall, they build a wall which has habitats actually in the wall to actually encourage the biosphere to come back in. And I think that is, that's a real way forward. And also the way we look at enclosed spaces, the, kind of the buildings that we make, we, we have a tendency to shut the biosphere out. So I'm sitting in my lounge here and the only evidence I've got of the biosphere is of the few plants I've got in this room. They're obviously the microbes living on me and on the floor, but there's not much space for the, for the biosphere to come back in. So we have to think at a very fundamental level how we start to design our urban structures in the future. Um, so, so, and there are, I think, there are already some very good ideas coming through on this. So that's one example. Then I think we have to, and this is obviously many people talking about this, we probably have to very fundamentally change the way that we resource our human structures from a, from, that's from energy and energy perspective. So at present, we rely on hydrocarbons basically to sustain the technosphere, the human systems that are associated with the technosphere. And we, we're using a huge amount of hydrocarbons. And of course, in doing that, what we're doing is burning fossil net primary production. So this is net primary production from long ago, from the Carboniferous period, 300 million years ago, or it might be from Ordovician seas from 450 million years ago. That's trapped energy that was trapped from sunlight long ago. We are now using that to sustain our 7 billion human beings our agriculture and all of the all of the animals that are consuming that agriculture and that we're consuming and in fact we need that energy to actually sustain all of that so at present we we, we have all that hydrocarbon energy that we're, we're using to sustain the, the the anthropocene biosphere but of course we know we can't go on doing that yeah. because that would have a fundamental impact on the on the climate system it is already having a fundamental impact on the climate system so we have to find a way over the next three or four decades depending on who you listen to, even shorter an even shorter time frame of transitioning from a hydrocarbon based world economy to one that uses other energy resources. Now, we, we can't morally, we can't say that everybody on planet Earth can't have a good lifestyle like, like we have in Western countries, for example. So we have to find a way around this. And that's perhaps where the technosphere working with the human component of the biosphere might be able to provide solutions to this and make it sustainable. At present, you, you know, you, you talked about the technosphere parasitizing the biosphere, and we, we've said that in the paper. But we've also said that we hope for a future in which the two can coexist. Now, for that to coexist sustainably, we have to transition away from hydrocarbon based energy resources sure. and the way that we're working at present. So I think those are the two kind of examples I would I would think of straight away changes in energy, changes in the way in which we we see ourselves in the in the in the biosphere, bringing the biosphere back into the the human realm. If if I may, I can use another, give you another example from from the geological record. So, two and a half billion years ago, organisms evolved the capacity to to use oxygenic photosynthesis. So they use the process of photosynthesis to fix energy and biomass that yielded oxygen to the atmosphere. Now that was catastrophic for the organisms that lived at the surface of our planet for the first billion years. They didn't like oxygen. They lived in an environment that had no oxygen and they were pushed out. They were pushed to the extremes. So those non-oxygen using organisms were really pushed to the margins of the biosphere. They're still there, but they've really been pushed out. You can see something of a pattern that's similar in the way that humans have been impacting on the biosphere. We have been gradually pushing the pre-human 
natural, if you like, the pre-human component of the biosphere to the margins. Um, again, if you kind of I could refer to Will Ellis's work here, where he's talked about the anthropization of the landscape. So he, he uses the term anthro, which is basically a strongly human influenced component of the of the Earth system, land, land surface, biosphere. And, and inside those kind of human anthromes, there are little pockets of the of the kind of non-human biosphere. And and I can see parallels between what's happening at present and what happened a very long time ago and has happened actually many times in geological history. Now, I, I don't really want that to continue on a trajectory where humans completely subsume the pre-human component of the biosphere. I think we need to live in tandem so that we can all benefit from this. And, and I see positive directions where we, we can potentially we can we can do that. I, I still th I think Seth and Ariana's work is really good. So these are the couple that have built these species walls in New York. But they've got lots of other ideas, and um, it's that's the direction to go. <laughs> Architects are thinking about this, so it's good. It sounds interesting. I'll definitely look them up. One of my I suppose reservations to an extent, though, the the idea of decoupling. This idea that we can use our technology and our uh, intelligence to to clever our way a way out of this is that you know if you, if you look at capitalism capitalism is a greater efficiency so like you know, cars are a lot more efficient than say 30 or 40 years ago but if you look what's happening though the scale is just massively outpacing our ability to be more efficient do we also need to take into account a certain degree of social logic that you know the whole whole idea that of prosperity and how we think about it and we live in this society where we, it seems to be consume 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 do, do we need to work on th those sort of things too yes i think so you're, you're right i mean I, i'm not the best person to talk about that because i think that's i think really economists need to come up with a new kind of e economics yeah. and and i'm not sure i mean we are wedded to this idea that economies must grow every year and that we must get we must get materially wealthier every year and monetarily wealthier every year um, that's perhaps not sustainable in the long term i'm not proficient to comment on that in great detail but i know exactly where you're coming from and i agree with you we need a new kind of economics and as yet i don't see any evidence for that new kind of economics so that's something that needs to develop the actual cost i mean i have i have seen figures where people have tried to estimate the human cost in terms of what the impact will be on the on the on the biosphere and the earth system in 100 years and 200 years um, and some of those figures frighten me quite a lot um, and so we do need a new economics to deal with this sure. and we're in this interval you know the great acceleration that will Stefan yeah. and others australian national university have kind of have developed and yes if that continues to accelerate exponentially then i think it's quite difficult to see how it's sustainable and what do you think about the importance of education as well? If, for example, a lot of young people don't come into contact with wildness and we spend a lot of time, like we do now, sitting in front of digital technology uh, um, rather than, you know, getting up a hill or engaging with fauna and flora. Do you think that plays an important part too? I think it does because I think that's all part of our detachment from the biosphere and the way in which we've actually separated ourselves. As a geologist, I'm very attached to the landscape and the biosphere, and I, I take students out and actually, and I, I look at the total landscape. I don't just look at the geology. I look at how it impacts on on everything. I think you're absolutely right. I think that is part and parcel of how humans see themselves as completely separate from the rest of the biosphere and how we've detached ourselves. And, and we do have to very rapidly realize that we are now stewards of this system because of our enormous power and that we have to live in a in a symbiotic relationship with it rather than simply simply using it um i can't i don't i can't give you a <laughs> solution no. No, no no i'm not expecting one but but i do see uh, going back to seth and ariana again i see examples good examples of where people are really thinking about this and that that's a way forward that really that that kind of work really heartens me and um, because scientists tend to look at this from a kind of cumulative perspective of impacts, but are not necessarily the, the people best placed sometimes to come up with the solutions. And this is where I think the Anthropocene has been extremely good because it's brought together multidisciplinary groups of people. Um, I would have never gone to a conference with architects 10 years ago. Now I'm happy to do it because I can see there are wonderful synergies from doing that. And therein, I think perhaps in the next few decades, 
is the is the possibility to to have some fairly radical solutions to these problems by bringing together these different groups. And I think the Anthropocene has been wonderful for doing that. So really good. So I'm being I'm being optimistic. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but in relation to the, that, maybe this idea of seeing the bigger picture. What is your understanding of the middle way in relation to what we've been talking about today? Okay, so so when you invited me to, to talk about this, I, I went and had a look at the website and I looked at lots of things you do, and I found that your philosophy was very similar to, to my philosophy. Um, so I, I guess the way forward has to find a balance, and I think that's really what the middle way is. Yeah. It has to find a balance between the way that humans consume on planet Earth. Because at the moment, the balance of consumption is not sustainable. We need to find a middle way whereby humans, the human component of the biosphere, the natural component of the biosphere, and the technosphere can all coexist for the benefit of all of us. And that's actually why I really liked the middle way, because that was the philosophy I could see coming through as well. And it's, that, it's about balance. Um, and that's that's what we've got to find. And, well, I, I think that you've certainly expressed that sentiment today in in what in how you've spoken, Mark. So yeah, I feel a lot of uh, resonance there. Do you think, in your opinion, is this the biggest challenge we've ever faced as a species? Um, yes, and I think it's been accumulating over a long long time frame, um, and that time frame's been unfolding over hundreds of thousands of years. But now the pace of change is so rapid and our response time is so short for us to be able to solve it that it is the most important event that humans have had to deal with in their entire existence as a species over 200,000 years. I think it's more significant than the major climate changes that species has, has had to deal with, um, you know, the natural climate changes with the ice advances and retreats. I think this is a very serious issue that we have to deal with very rapidly. Well, well I, I hope that this paper and your other work has, you know, have made a contribution to increasing that awareness about this situation we face, Mark. And, and Barry, I, I sincerely thank you for, for the opportunity to actually discuss this and to, you know, that's been really good. I thank you for that. Smashing. Well, just my last question, if people wanted to find out more about your work, Mark, how would they go about it? Um, Oh, <laughs> okay. So I guess the, the scientific paper is probably not the best route to start off with. So I think there are lots of very good books out there. Um, so Ton Tony Bonofsky has written a, a book very recently, 2014, which talks about the impact of humans on the biosphere. So I could recommend you to go to his book. Yeah. Um, Jan and I have, have you, you mentioned the Goldilocks planet, and I, yeah. I don't kind of want to plug my book, but <laughs> it's, a good, it's a good kind of general entree, I think, into looking at the way that the Earth system has been very balanced over a long period of time. And then at the end of that book, we actually look at the human impact and, and show how humans are kind of changing that balance. So moving away from the middle way that the biosphere and the Earth system has been able to plot over four and a half billion years of time. So I, I would go for a good popular science book, book like that. And I'm, obviously, I'm always very happy to help guide people if anybody did want to ask me about roots into this. Well, it's been a, a real pleasure talking to you today, um, Mark, and absolutely fascinating. And uh, yes, so thank you very much for talking to me. Barry, I thank you also. Thank you very much. It's been, been really nice chatting with you. You can find out more about Middleway Philosophy at www.middlewaysociety.org